my name is Philip Munoz. I am a professor in the political science department and a faculty member at the law school. And it's my privilege to direct Notre Dame's program on constitutional studies. Uh, I, I'm thrilled with this uh, turnout right before break. Uh, it, it's not every year that uh, one of your colleagues and uh, best friends uh, writes the book that everyone is talking about. It's not every summer that the president or former president of the United States uh, posts on Facebook about that, about that book to 53 million people. And it's not every night that you have uh, your friend and two of the nation's most thoughtful and important and consequential political commentators uh, gathered together on campus. Uh, I'm absolutely thrilled uh, with the panel we put together, because um, that night, tonight. So thank you to our panelists. Uh, uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, there's a few people I want to formally thank before I turn it over to our Tokyo fellow to introduce our speakers. Uh, Bishop Davidson. Bishop, where are you? Stand up, Bishop. Bishop's here representing the Intercollegiate Studies Institute. They're uh, co-sponsoring tonight's event with us. The Intercollegiate Studies Institute is an uh, uh, educational institution. Uh, they do uh, summer programs, have all sorts of resources and opportunities for students, so especially our students in the audience, please uh, find Bishop after the event if you're interested in learning more about the Intercollegiate Studies Institute. Uh, thank you to ISI. I want to thank my staff, uh, Sarah Joyce here. Sarah's been with us for a few months and has done an extraordinary job. Uh, actually, would you please uh, join me in thanking Sarah? She's responsible. to our student workers as well. Uh, as I mentioned, I direct our Constitutional Studies program. We have a minor here in Constitutional Studies at Notre Dame uh, for all you students interested in questions of law and politics, policy. Uh, I encourage you to learn more about Constitutional Studies. A minor, Professor Deneen, is one of our core faculty members. Uh, I also direct our Tocqueville program, and uh, we have our Tocqueville Fellows. Uh, that's about two dozen students who um, they just dine with our speakers, they meet our speakers, they help uh, come up with event ideas. Uh, and if you're interested in uh, becoming an integral part of this program, please talk to me uh, if you're an undergraduate about the Tokyo Fellows Program. One of the things both programs do is we sponsor events like tonight, and we actually have a, another banner event tomorrow at 11 a.m. Uh, tomorrow morning. Uh, we're going to have a debate on the Trump presidency uh, between Charles Kessler and Jonah Goldberg. So, I invite you to come back uh, for more uh, tomorrow morning. Again, that's at 11 a.m. That's going to be in uh, the Nanny Jenkins Hall in the forum there. Uh, so 11 a.m. Uh, our format for tonight is as follows. Uh, we're going to have Professor Deneen speak for uh, about 12 minutes, and then uh, Mr. Goldberg and then Professor Kessler will speak for about the same amount of time, and then we'll have a conversation among the panelists and, and with you, the audience. As I mentioned, uh, we have our Tokyo Fellows, and we have our fellows introduce our speakers. So I'm going to call to the uh, podium Jarek Jankowski. Jarek's a senior. Uh, I'm told he's off to law school. We'll see about that. Um, but Jarek will inter uh, introduce our speakers for me. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Munoz. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce our panelists tonight. Dr. Patrick Deneen is the David A. Patenziani Professor of Political Science at the University of Notre Dame. After receiving a bachelor's in English Literature and a doctorate in Political Science from Rutgers University, he taught at Princeton and at Georgetown before arriving at Notre Dame. He works in the field of political theory and has authored four books, edited three others, including authoring his most recent book, Why Liberalism Failed, which explores the themes of tonight's panel. Jonah Goldberg is a senior editor at the National Review and holds the Asnes Chair in Applied Liberty at the American Enterprise Institute. A best-selling author and syndicated columnist, he has a weekly column in the Los Angeles Times, is on the board of contributors for USA Today, and is a regular contributor on Fox News. He is the author of three books, including his most recent, Suicide of the West, How the Rebirth of Tribalism, Populism, Nationalism, and identity politics is destroying American democracy. He has a bachelor's from Goucher College. Dr. Charles Kessler is the Daniel Dykema Distinguished Professor of Government at Claremont McKenna College. He is the editor of the Claremont Review of Books and Senior Fel Fellow at the Claremont Institute. 
a specialist in American constitutionalism and American political thought, Dr. Kessler is the author of I Am the Change, Barack Obama and the Crisis of Liberalism, as well as editor of a best-selling edition of the Federalist Papers. Please join me in welcoming our first speaker, Professor Patrick Deneen, to the podium. Thank you very much uh, uh, for that introduction, and uh, my friend and colleague, Professor Munoz, for organizing tonight's uh, event. Uh, I had counted on uh, all of you students being busy uh, doing other things, and so I'm disappointed to see the turnout tonight. Uh, and I would normally say it's nice to see so many friendly faces, but I know you're really here to see your professor taking down a peg or two. Uh, I can assure you that will surely happen tonight. Uh, but I still have your papers that I haven't graded yet. So, uh, just, a, just a warning. Uh, this is. Um, uh, it's a wonderful event, but I'm also really quite embarrassed by it. Uh, some of you may uh, remember uh, or have been present. Uh, Professor Munoz sponsored a lecture uh, on my book that I delivered last spring. And uh, uh, so this seems like a kind of embarrassment of, uh, of opportunities to speak about uh, one's work on one's own campus. And it's an odd thing, in a way, for a professor to speak about his or her own work on one's own campus. It's not typically done. Uh, and so it's a, it's a great honor for me to be able not only to speak about uh, this book, uh, but to have such, uh, really such uh, powerful and insightful interlocutors tonight. What strikes me about um, these interlocutors tonight is, uh, I guess in the first instance, perhaps the reason for uh, this event is in part, uh, while they are here uh, to debate each other tomorrow, tonight is really an opportunity for, for them to, the, to really affirm, to affirm how much they have in common. Uh, <laughs> Shortly. But I can actually begin by saying that this particular configuration is striking for how much agreement I think there is uh, on this panel. Uh, I think we all agree that something is terribly awry uh, in this country uh, and across the Western world, and that it has something to do with the crisis of Western philosophy and liberal philosophy. We agree, I think, substantively uh, that at least uh, a considerable part of the problem is taking place on the political left today. I think that's something we agree on pretty strongly. Uh, the, the rise of a certain strain of progressivism uh, that uh, we see very much in evidence uh, uh, even in recent days, uh, that has, uh, of course, historically uh, been closely linked to a form of statism that uh, I think we would probably share the view that has uh, had a certain antipathy toward the moral foundations of our civil society. Uh, that its form of historicism has led, among other things, to a kind of antipathy to the past and to tradition and uh, to the importance of knowing uh, our past and where we come from. And I think we would also uh, agree pretty considerably on what we see as the illiberalism of the contemporary left liberal uh, uh, party in America, that it has established a kind of new orthodoxy that we see especially on our college campuses. I think, thankfully, not here yet, uh, and that it increasingly brooks no dissent uh, and has indeed uh, increasingly shut down the capacity for people to have civil conversation uh, and disagreements on college campuses. But our agreement is perhaps less interesting to you tonight than where we disagree. And I suspect that the deepest source of our disagreement is the explanation for the source of our current woes. I think both. Uh, Jonah Goldberg and uh, Charles Kessler locate uh, a genuine advance in the history of the world and human civilization in the Enlightenment, and particularly at the time preceding, shortly preceding, uh, and leading into the American founding, especially the figure John Locke looms large in all of our narratives. And while they credit Locke with having been, uh, as having established uh, this monumental achievement, what uh, Jonah calls the miracle, I credit with having, or blame with having in many ways, sown the seeds of its own self-destruction. And that the crisis that we are experiencing arises in considerable part because of the very success of the project envisioned uh, some 400, 500 years ago and instantiated uh, at the creation of our nation. Um, I argue then that the source of our woes lies not in the failures of liberalism to live up to itself, but in its success in having achieved 
and realized its core commitments, not merely as a matter of philosophy, but instantiated in our reality, in our way of life. As I suggest in the book, liberalism has failed because it has succeeded. And in particular, it has succeeded by in some ways eliminating or uh, forcing the receding of the countervailing elements that in some ways uh, offered a kind of corrective to uh, the deepest uh, commitments of liberalism. Here I just borrow, in fact, I just steal from uh, the author I rely on the most. I'm teaching the semester Alexis de Tocqueville. Uh, who argued uh, um, uh, at great length that liberal democracy would need, in some ways, sources and correctives that liberalism couldn't itself provide, uh, but which it would likely draw down on and not be capable of replenishing. He's thinking here of community life, of religious life, of uh, family life, uh, and, uh, uh, and these uh, sources of uh, forms of democratic civic life that we see uh, weakened throughout our uh, society today. Now, in the view of many, and this is the kind of standard view, this thing that we're discussing tonight, liberalism, this philosophy, liberalism is really a kind of null set, in a sense. It establishes the rules of the game. It sets up, as our Constitution does, one might argue, it sets up a set of neutral political conditions so that people of varying views and beliefs and dispositions, individuals and groups, can pursue their varied and pluralistic conceptions of the good or no conception of the good at all. It sets up a framework, then, that protects the widest possible expression and pursuit of a kind of diverse pluralism that could be imaginable in, in, the, uh, in the world. That it itself, as a philosophy, is not a bearer or seeks to convey a substantive worldview. It is, in some senses, at least in this understanding, indifferent to people's beliefs. Neutral, non-judgmental, it doesn't take a stand. It merely seeks to be a fair referee that when implications of those beliefs, particularly uh, the ways in which those might get expressed in the public world, in the material world, that the, the referee, in this case the state, may need to step in and say it's time for you to have a timeout or to sit in the penalty box for a time. Now the argument in my book is actually uh, uh, claims the opposite and argues, uh, argues to the contrary. In this, I'm not alone, and I have, I have many thinkers uh, that I might credit as forebears. But my argument is that liberalism, in fact, does contain and indeed smuggles in a kind of substantive set of commitments and beliefs, and indeed a vision of the human being, and that it shapes and forms us. It shapes and forms us not in the kind of oppressive way that we might recognize easily in earlier civilizations, in the Middle Ages, or in ancient Greece, or Rome, where you were forced by law to have a certain belief system. And if you happen to be a Socrates walking around asking you know, uncomfortable questions, uh, you would probably run afoul of those beliefs and be subject to condemnation and death by that society. Rather, liberalism, this belief system, shapes and forms in much more subtle ways, in ways that are not very evident to us, in ways that in some ways seduce us into the view that the, the views and the beliefs and even the dispositions that we adopt are the matter of our own private and individual choices. And yet, in the end, tends to erase pluralism. Tends to erase the things that in some ways it claimed to come into being <clears throat> to defend. It makes us increasingly into the individuals that it imagined and posited existed in this imaginary state of nature. That in the state of nature, we might imagine ourselves to be these placeless, timeless, cultureless, religionless, familyless, and religious-less human naked creatures. Now, such creatures have never existed in any time, in any place. Of course, most obvious that we're born into relationships, ones that we don't choose, although my children sometimes wish they could have, <laughs> uh, and ones uh, that we are uh, not, not subject to our voluntary alteration. <clears throat> 
And yet what liberalism in some ways does is to create a, a massive and increasingly world-straddling apparatus to make us and make possible the creation of such human types and human creatures. And so what's odd and striking is the system, this political philosophy that came into being claiming to be about a limited state creates the most powerful and most expansive state that has ever existed. The most straddling and sprawling state structure that involves and ingratiates itself into every aspect of human life. It would have made the kings of old jealous to have this form of control. But it also creates, of course, a market system and indeed ultimately ingratiates itself into every aspect of society, including ultimately that most core part of society, the family, and creates increasingly humans that are placeless and timeless and borderless and cultureless and familyless and religiousness. And it erases pluralism. We talk constantly about diversity, and yet we are a society that's increasingly not very diverse at all. As a result of this condition, and indeed of this apparatus, people experience a kind of felt condition of powerlessness in relationship to this overarching state and market structure, which I think explains a good deal of the political eruptions in recent years. At the very moment when people are told, you are the most free you have ever been, what one hears increasingly from large numbers of our countrymen and country uh, and citizens across the world is a felt sense of powerlessness, especially in the domains where they are supposed to be the most powerful as citizens and as members of a global marketplace. And if one thinks about it, what we call populism today is a deep and profound reaction to the powerlessness felt in both of these domains. <laughs> Thus, the experience of this theoretical liberation of this individual self is felt, in fact, in some ways to be fundamentally illusory. But I think even more deeply, it turns out that the more liberated we are, the more we are these creatures imagined in the state of nature, although created through this massive apparatus, the more we find that the end condition isn't the happiness that was promised to us. What's striking about our age of great prosperity, and I'm sure we'll hear more about how prosperous we are, and of great liberty, is it turns out we're not terribly happy by a lot of measurements. The levels of, of loneliness, uh, the levels of self-medication, the levels of suicide are strikingly depressing in this age of plenty, in this age of freedom. And so I think in a way, I, at least I can imagine that in what I'm describing, I'm actually agreeing with Jonah Goldberg about the achievements of liberalism. For what he will, I think, in fact, celebrate, I in many ways lament. But I think that's why we're here tonight, to discuss whether or not we should be happy or sad, or at least have the opportunity to have some nice dessert while we consider this question. <laughs> <laughs> telling Patrick beforehand, um, I, um, I've been dipping in and out of his book for a long time, but I finally decided i got to go soup to nuts if I'm going to do this thing. So over the last two days on a drive to and from Ohio, I listened to the book on, on Audible, and while going 90 miles an hour, I'm taking notes with my right hand <laughs> that when you look at them over there, it looks like I was trying, if they had been in blood, it would look like I was trying to identify my killer. <laughs> they just sort of trail off like that. Uh, and because of the schedule today, I didn't get a chance to organize them the way I wanted to, so that's why I was writing so furiously. Um, so, happy to be here. Um, I understand I only have about 12 minutes, so as uh, Henry VIII said to Egypt is wise, I won't keep you long. Um, I should start by saying uh, it was bizarre when, when, when Patrick's book came out and my book came out, or vice versa, I can't remember the order. All these people said, oh, we've got to get you and Patrick to debate because, you know, you come to these completely opposite views. That's really not true. There's an enormous amount of overlap in the Venn diagrams between um, our problems. And it's a very strange place for me to be in, to have written a book called Suicide of the West, and I'm the optimist. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, that's, that's weird. Um, 
So I always say I agree with vast swaths of Patrick's book. I agree with um, very much, very passionately about the need to create um, smaller, more autonomous local communities embedded in a place, in a time, in a custom. I've been talking about federalism as the greatest system ever conceived of for maximizing human happiness uh, for almost 20 years. Um, I want, <clears throat> we hear way too much about uh, diversity, which basically means we want every institution to be filled with a bunch of people who look different but think alike, when in reality what we should want in this country is more variety. You gotta protect basic civil rights, you gotta protect the Bill of Rights, you gotta protect all that, but beyond that, send as much power down to this local level possible and let people live the way they want to live. Um, it'll make it very minimum as a more interesting country to drive across. Um, so I agree with all of that and a lot more. I would, and I, as Patrick suggests, I agree with a lot of this critique of the left. Um, I am less convinced that it is part of uh, liberalism the way he, he frames it. I think a large swath of it is a rebellion against liberalism, which is why I emphasize romanticism in my book. Um, but let's, well, let me just sort of back up for a second. Um, one of the things I like about, I'm not sure he'll like this comparison, one of the things I really like about uh, Patrick Cook is it reminds me a great deal of The Road to Serfdom. Uh, it is an important book, it is an educational book, it's an enlightening book, but it is also in a certain sense a prosecutor's brief against liberalism. It leaves no indictment out and at least very few compliments in. And I understand where Patrick is coming from when he does this, uh, but when I read it, it's, it's very much, or I should say, listen to it. Uh, <laughs> I keep wondering, um, you know, where's the good stuff? You know, it's this 500 year mistake that I understand on a chalkboard, you can say, okay, these bad ideas, but in that 500 years, Life has thrived, and one of the things that we're supposed to believe is in the value of life. Well, in that 500 years, life expectancy went from 30 to 86. It was common in this country 100 years ago for every family, basically, to know what it was like to experience the death of a child. Um, Calvin Coolidge, when he was the President of the United States, his son was playing tennis on the tennis courts at the White House, got a blister on his foot, it got infected, he died a week later. That was normal. And yet, you know, one of the things that you know, we're supposed to, I thought we were supposed to care about, is you know, alleviation of poverty, of improvement of quality of life. And I'm not saying, I agree with Patrick entirely that maybe we care too much about these things these days. But that is a very different thing that at least by implication to suggest that we shouldn't care about them at all. And I, for one, do not want to go back 500 years ago. I'm sure that Joachim of Fior was a fascinating guy to have some mead with. <laughs> um, but I like modern dentistry and air conditioning and modern medicine. And I like the idea that I shouldn't expect a lot of dead children in my life. Um, and these things should be, I think, at minimum, appreciated. It's weird. In a, in a certain way, I kind of feel like my book is the is the circle in the middle of a three-way Venn diagram between Patrick's book and Steven Pinker's book. Steven Pinker basically writes a book, as far as I can tell, where it's just, if it's enlightenment, it's awesome, it's the stuff I like, and if it's the stuff I don't like, it's not the enlightenment. And, uh, and first of all, I don't believe that because there are lots of different enlightenments, and you know, some of them were really bad. Um, and a lot of bad things came out of the enlightenment. And I would argue one of the things that came out of the French enlightenment wasn't really liberalism, but a different mode of sort of Rousseauian romanticism and nationalism that um, I think that Patrick often lays at the feet of liberalism. Um, but let me back up. All right, so I, I, just, I have a few points I just want to make in order just to start the conversation. Um, Patrick is vastly more qualified as a political philosopher than I am. This is not a difficult thing for me to conceive. <laughs> but I think I can also say that um, I have some expertise as a rank pundit. And uh, when I, I have no problem with Patrick, again, saying that 
the Republicans or conservatives or conservative liberals, whatever label you want to put on them, care too much about the free market and globalism. But that is just not all that conservatives in the last 50 or 100 years in America care about. And there are a couple times where Patrick uses phrases like, they just pay lip service to these other things, like religious freedom, like, I don't know, abortion. And uh, abortion is one of the, uh, pro-life is one of the defining features of the conservative movement. And it is not an example of the rampant selfishness that, that, that Patrick ascribes to liberalism. It is entirely other-oriented, which is one of the reasons why conservatives have a hard time making that case in our culture. And on that point, I agree entirely with Patrick. But it's, you cannot just dismiss, or I don't think you should, dismiss all the things that conservatives argue for other than NAFTA and TPP and say that these things are fake and we're going to reduce all of conservatism to uh, essentially the one aspect of it that I really don't like. Which brings me to another point. Um, there is this repeated theme in Patrick's argument about getting back to nature, about a connectedness to nature, about how culture emerges from nature. Um, and that there are these assumptions that I disagree with, not as a matter of philosophy or poetry or, or, or any of that, but as a matter of just empirical fact. There's this Malthusian strain that runs through it that constantly asserts that we, would, we are running out of resources because of modern technological capitalism. History just simply doesn't bear that out. Doesn't mean that there aren't problems. Whatever, wherever you come down in global warming, that's a perfectly legitimate thing to be concerned about. I personally care a great deal about endangered species, something to care about. But the places where endangered species are most endangered are in places where liberalism is the least secured, and capitalism is the least secured. Places like the United States of America, the environment is vastly better than it was 100 years ago, even 50 years ago. There are more trees in North America today than there were 100 years ago. And if you had listened to a Patrick Deneen making the exact same argument about the, the terrible force of technology and its dehumanization, well, if we had listened and followed his advice 100 years ago, we would be almost completely denuded of forests because we would be using them, we would be using wood for all of our fuel, we'd be using it for all of our construction. And you can go down the list. When, at what point should our skepticism about technology become a prohibition against it? What medicine do we want to say, you know, I know that's liberating, we can get rid of Alzheimer's, but really the, 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 the downside is just too great. So maybe we should just sort of close this off. I'm someone who does believe passionately that innovation is a wonderful thing, even though it has costs. I would also say that this is not, that the telos that Patrick ascribes to liberalism, is that it always leads to one mode of thinking, leaves out the fact that there's room for all sorts of self-correction. <coughs> um, uh, reverence for nature in the United States today is vastly greater than reverence for nature was Certainly when the Native Americans were here and they were chasing off whole herds of buffalo off of cliffs just to pick out the best parts and burning half of the forest lands to create prairies. And it's certainly better than when the Americans came here and started shooting all the buffalo to make coats. We now, when you get rich, you tend to protect your environment, not destroy it. I also think uh, Patrick talks often about how today's meritocratic system creates winners and losers relentlessly with relentless efficiency. I agree entirely, and there are enormous problems with this. One of the problems that I try to bring up all the time is that complexity is a subsidy. The more complex you make society, the more you're rewarding smart people, or well-connected people, or rich people to be able to get over those hurdles, and you're blocking people who have a good work ethic, but don't have the right connections or the cognitive power. And I think that's a perfectly legitimate point to keep in mind. But my gosh, aristocracy creates winners and losers too. And not only does it keep the winners instantiated in perpetuity as an inherited right for all time to, the, to doctrines such as the divine right of kings, it also keeps the vast majority of people in perpetual slavery or serfdom. That's not good. In fact, can't we at least celebrate a little bit in the prosecutor's brief the fact that what was remarkable about liberalism in the United States of America is not that we had slavery, but that we got rid of it? And that slavery was in fact 
inconsistent with liberalism, but not inconsistent with any other reigning ideology of the last 10,000 years? Isn't that something we can wave our little foam finger a little bit about? Say we're number one for? I also think that one of the problems that, uh, and this is slightly inter interpretive, I think many of the things that, that Patrick points out and that he's right about were also pointed out by Joseph Schumpeter. And uh, Schumpeter basically pointed out that what happens when you have mass affluence, and he, was going, he goes back to Nietzsche and Nietzsche's genealogy and morals about how you basically have a priestly class and a knightly class. And the priestly class, their only weapons are words. And they use those words to undermine virtue. And they undermine virtue by making it into vice. And so in Nietzsche's analysis, which I do not agree with, but in Nietzsche's analysis, Christianity takes the knightly virtues of strength and power and pride and will and turns them into vices and elevates meekness and humility. Um, I think one of the, the problems that we have today are not problems of liberalism. They are problems of the sociology and anthropology and neuroscience that makes uh, the managerial class or the new class that Schumpeter talks about possible and that we need to be on guard. But we should not be pointing our bayonets at liberalism. We should be pointing at the people who are talking it down. And so let me just conclude by reiterating, I really did like the book. <laughs> but I think that this is one of these things, where, yeah, I talk about John Locke a lot in my book, but I, I sh and I should have been more clear. Um, I do not think John Locke created what I call the mirror. I think John Locke is a good symbol or, rep or, or stand in for what it is. I believe passionately that uh, we are all a little Lockean and we're all a little Rousseauian. And when I say that, I don't mean that we are two kinds of liberal. Mm -hmm. I mean that we are two kinds of person where we all want to be respected for our, our innate individual contributions and, and uniqueness. And we also want to be part of a group. We're all a little tribal and we're all a little individualistic. And these get manifested in different ideological traditions. And I just, I, I understand where Patrick is coming from, but I do not and cannot get there, at least not yet, of conflating the Rousseauian collective sort of general will tradition with the Lockean uh, rugged individual tradition. I don't think that they are, these are two sides of the same counterfeit coin, as Patrick put it. I think they're different coins. And I, I have a sense of where, I, I'm guessing where Charles would go, but I, the last thing I would just simply say is that the problem isn't liberalism, it's statism. And statism isn't the natural consequence of liberalism, but it is the thing that liberalism needs to be on guard against at all times, because it is the enemy of freedom. And can't we just have a few nice words about freedom? I mean, you know, we're not Canadians. We're supposed to like liberty at least a little bit, right? So anyway, thank you all very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to be here, and I wanted to thank uh, Phil Munoz, over here my old uh, friend, uh, who runs the Tocqueville program uh, here in Notre Dame, and I wanted also to thank Bishop Davidson from ISI. He doesn't look like a bishop, uh, and yet he is. Uh, <clears throat> so. Um, I, I was invited to this panel in, in, in which one member has written a, a very interesting new book called Why Liberalism Failed, um, and the other has written a very interesting new book which could be called Why Liberalism Succeeded. Um, I don't really have a bear in this fight, uh, exactly, I mean, but uh, I, I am reminded of Abraham Lincoln's story about the old wife uh, whose husband became involved in a life and death struggle with a big bear that wandered onto their property. And uh, she was excited, it turns out, by the intensity of the struggle, so much so that she found herself yelling, go it, husband, and also 
go it, bear. <laughs> so I'm not sure which one is the bear. Uh, I, I guess Joan is more ursine. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I wanted to begin by congratulating you both of them on, uh, on their books, although I'm really here to talk uh, uh, more about Patrick's. Um, it, it's uh, no one who ha uh, only someone who has written a book, I think, knows how much toil and uh, difficulty and uh, uh, tears and sweat go into uh, the production of it. And, it. and when it is a good book like both of these, uh, it is certainly something that they should be uh, well congratulated on. I'm especially impressed by the way that um, Patrick makes the argument for the cultural effects of liberalism. Uh, that liberalism, uh, however you define it, as a political doctrine, has cultural effects. Politics affects culture. Politics shapes culture. Uh, it's not just downstream from culture. Uh, politics can change culture. And that, I think, is a powerful and a good uh, lesson that we ought to keep in mind. But the question uh, to ask, it seems to me, is whether all liberalism is created equal, uh, and whether the classical liberalism that uh, his book begins by discussing is really the, the headwater of the, ad, what he calls advanced liberalism, which is the liberalism, the progressivism, the political correct liberalism of today. Are they really connected uh, in a direct and ineluctable way. Well, um, let me begin, though, by talking a little bit about Tocqueville, because this is the Tocqueville program, and, uh, and Patrick is a scholar of Tocqueville. And in, in reading his book, uh, of course, you're, you're, you notice immediately some differences between his book and Tocqueville's. <laughs> for, for one thing, his book is much shorter than <laughs> Tocqueville's and not written in French. Um, but there's also a sense in which, coming from someone who knows Tocqueville well, the departures from Tocqueville are themselves interesting, I think. So, let me talk a little bit about that. Tocqueville wrote uh, his big book on democracy, Democracy in America, because to him, democracy seemed to be the key to modern politics and to modern life. It was this, what he called this grand social revolution, which had advanced, was advancing all over the world and was most advanced in America. And he came from France to America to study it, to study this new phenomenon of uh, democracy or this somewhat new phenomenon in its most advanced state, to study the vanguard of democracy. But when Tocqueville looks at many of the same social problems, dysfunctions that uh, Patrick Deneen looks at. He regards them as effects or byproducts of the democratic revolution. So for instance, individualism and materialism, these two forces which Patrick is eloquent in diagnosing and denouncing in his book as aspects of liberalism. Uh, as it turns out in his argument, both original liberalism, the founders' liberalism, and modern liberalism, are for Tocqueville not an effect of liberalism per se at all. For him, individualism and materialism come from democracy, not liberalism. And so they're much older. Liberalism begins, let's say, in the 17th century with Thomas Hobbes and John Locke and many other theorists. But um, democracy goes back many centuries before the 17th century. According to Tocqueville, the modern democratic revolution has its wellsprings in the 12th century. The beginnings of the democratic revolution go back many centuries before John Locke, before Thomas Hobbes, before Francis Bacon, before any of the philosophical sources which are so important in 
of Patrick's argument. And with the rise of democracy for, it's, it's approaching a millennium, but not quite there yet, many centuries of the rise of democracy, individualism and materialism have been growing apace. Christianity, uh, from Tocqueville's point of view, is a fertile source of equality and individualism long before anyone ever heard of John Locke. Uh, Christianity has the effect of putting the emphasis on the soul of every individual, the immortal soul of every individual. And particularly in its Protestant form, that individualism is quite radical. This is long before the state of nature became an active principle in political theory. If you look at uh, John Bunyan's A Pilgrim's Progress, for example, a classic doctrine of the Puritan um, movement in, in uh, England, Christian, the, the central character, abandons his family and his country, leaves them behind, moves out of the house and away from them in order to seek personal salvation in the celestial city. This was a powerful drama illustrating the individual desire for salvation at the heart of Christianity and made radical by Protestantism. But in all denominations of Christianity, there is an individualism that tends to cut across family, uh, social relations, and political loyalties. Uh, by this I mean to say simply that Christianity contributes to the problem of democracy and not merely to its solution. And that with the rise of Christianity, with the division between the things that are Caesar's and the things that belong to God, unprecedented um, and, and in a way unexampled un in any other world religion, um, any, any direct return to the ancient world or to the, um, the, the, what Patrick sometimes calls the polis and the, uh, the commitments of the polis is really made impossible or at least extremely difficult because your loyalties as a human being lie not just to your polis, to your community, and to its gods, but to the God, the real God, the God of all men everywhere, but of no city or no country in particular. Now, Tocqueville was well aware of John Locke and especially Spinoza. Uh, there's an interesting attack on pantheism in Tocqueville's Democracy in America, which is really an attack on Spinoza. But Tocqueville found that the great problem of modernity was not liberalism, per se, but democracy. Democracy is, he said famously, a providential fact. It's been growing unstoppably since the 12th century. And he was warning his fellow Frenchmen who had tried a democratic revolution in the French Revolution and had, and had in a way failed spectacularly and continued to repeat those failures in the early 19th century, he was warning them that they had no choice but to accept a democratic future of some kind. America was precisely interesting to him because it had successfully passed the revolutionary phase and had found a way to have a stable and relatively wholesome democracy. Man is neither entirely free nor entirely unfree Tocqueville taught, um, we have a freedom within a realm of necessity. We can't choose whether the world around us will become more democratic, but we do have this important choice left in our control, whether to have democracy with liberty or democracy without liberty, whether to have 
as we would say today, liberal democracy or illiberal democracy, democracy with servitude. Many of those things that, that Patrick tends to deprecate, like rights, legal formalities, constitutional checks on majority and minority factions, this liberalism, classical liberalism of the founder sort, is for Tocqueville precious and irreplaceable because this kind of liberalism moderates the democracy and helps to redeem it. Liberalism for Tocqueville, uh, in, this, in that sense, liberal democracy, the element of individual freedom, of formal legal guarantees, uh, of due process, of separation of powers and constitutional formalities too. That form of political liberalism is a kind of nobility or a kind of principle of nobility within democracy that elevates what could otherwise be a very um, lowest common denominator, leveling, downward pulling democratic phenomenon. These liberal elements, including rights, individual rights and, its protect, uh, and the protections of those rights, and capitalism as a form of the pursuit of those rights in economic circumstances, help to keep democracy liberal and open to human greatness, protecting and fostering the art and science of associations, as Tocqueville calls it, that Americans excel at. And Patrick knows all about that and can, can tell us about that. But the spring behind these associations, which moves all of us, you know, this is still true as a sociological fact, Americans form associations more readily than any other people in the world. We form associations, we form business corporations, we form symphony orchestras, <coughs> excuse me. We form uh, stamp collecting clubs. We join together voluntarily with no top-down instruction, no government regulations, no uh, imperatives or rules from outside or above us. We do this um, as, a, as a facet of our self-government in civil society. Um, the spring that moves us to make these associations and to join them is what Tocqueville called self-interest rightly understood, which is a very democratic morality. Um, Patrick would call this not democratic but liberal, and I think to that extent he would condemn it as a base form of self-interest, of calculation, of utilitarian uh, maximization. And it certainly partakes of all of those things. Tocqueville criticizes it for the same reasons, but he also embraces it as he embraces democracy as a whole because they are productive of civic and human good and sometimes they even approach human excellence. Tocqueville has his eye on what Americans and Frenchmen can actually choose and be responsible for in their lives. In that sense, it is a practical book, a book of advice for perplexed Democrats and enemies of democracy. Um, but why liberalism failed uh, is about what Patrick calls the ideology of liberalism. Now, it's not clear one can choose an ideology because almost by definition, an ideology is not worthy of choice. An, ide an ideology is not philosophy. An ideology is a set of rationalizations for positions taken that, that are indefensible on other grounds. I don't think it's clear that the American founders, from Patrick's point of view, and I would be interested, of course, to hear what he has to say on this. <laughs> it's not clear from the book that the American founders chose Lockean liberalism exactly, or, or whether they, in fact, succumbed to it as the most powerful ideological current in their day, the most powerful current of opinion or belief. 
There is therefore the risk in this kind of analysis of a, of a sort of ideological determinism at work. Certainly in the way that uh, this book tends to sweep all of the founders into one basket, the basket of Lockean liberalism. And indeed, to sweep all of America into the same <laughs> basket of original classical Lockean liberal principles. This um, amalgamation, I think, tends to make the founders uninteresting in themselves. Um, and it, to some extent, it threatens to make all of American history and politics uninteresting, um, exactly as it did for Louis Hartz, whose famous book from the 1950s, The Liberal Tradition in America, Patrick's book often resembles. Except that instead of longing for the exciting politics of European-style socialism, as Louis Hartz did, Patrick longs for a virtuous politics uh, uh, before liberalism, a, a, pre, a kind of pre-liberal politics, uh, whatever that would be exactly. As I've indicated, it's hard to go back to Aristotle once you have experienced Christ. And so what exactly the nature of this alternative to uh, the Declaration of Independence and to American liberalism is, is a, a, a large question looming over this book. Hence, Patrick doesn't distinguish much between the founders' liberalism and today's to come to a point that uh, Jonah has already made. Uh, well, today's liberalism, according to this book, is merely advanced liberalism. That's his term, advanced liberalism. In other words, there's no point in fighting to reclaim the founders' liberalism from its contemporary despisers. Think of the politically correct folks on campus and the identitarian furies that they have let loose in not only on campus but into the mainstream of American politics. There doesn't seem to be any point in fighting them in an attempt to go back to the founders' liberalism uh, because the founders' liberalism is just an early stage of the present disease. Because today's illib Ill illiberal liberalism um, he regards as essentially a logical conclusion of the founders' principles. Now, he doesn't claim, to his credit, that the founders would agree with these conclusions but having agreed with the premises, his argument is they would have no way to refuse the conclusions if they were offered to them. They wouldn't come to them themselves. They wouldn't raise them themselves. Thomas Jefferson and John Adams are not woke. <laughs> <laughs> Jefferson's pretty woke. But, <laughs> But, but his point is they have no good defense against the social justice warriors. We understand that in this, sense, in this important sense, their principles, the founders' principles, better than they did. We see the implications and the limitations of their principles. We see the effectual truth of classical liberalism which is advanced liberalism. What, the, what those old principles turned into and led to. But the reliance on effectual truth is a Machiavellian principle. So this, despite uh, Patrick's anti-Machiavellianism, of which I don't think we're, we're, I'm not calling that into question, <laughs> the, 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 ana the analysis is Machiavellian in a certain point of view. We're not interested in what the founders, the case, the best case the founders could make for their liberalism. We're interested in what their liberalism led to, which is to say what other people did later with their freedom, with the freedom that the United States and its laws had bequeathed them. So in this very interesting and very good book that I certainly recommend to you 
um, there's a kind of super theoretical point of view which looks to pass, as it were, the niceties of the arguments of Tocqueville or of the Federalists or of the Declaration of Independence to what they boil down to today. And there is, at the same time, a rather uh, a, a, an impractical uh, concern with, you know, turning your back on this, on the only way of life that we know, in a way, which is liberalism. Now, but that liberalism, that, that one word, of course, may include several different kinds of um, phenomena. <coughs> but to discuss all this, we will turn to the questions of the next period. Thank you very much. Gentlemen, gentlemen thank you very much. Uh, this whole panel was an advertisement for what we do. Uh, Aristotle, Machiavelli, Probably slightly different atmospheres. Uh, maybe, maybe we can get in, I'll moderate a conversation for a bit and then we'll turn to questions um, to give Professor Deneen a chance uh, to respond uh, to some of the comments. Maybe I'll, I'll respond as you see fit, but to direct you just to a few. Uh, if uh, uh, maybe a main point from each, uh, Jonah Goldberg says, hey, isn't it uh, nice that we have a antibiotics uh, and that we live? <laughs> And uh, Professor Kessler says, uh, this is a big one, uh, do, what, do with it what you can. Uh, didn't Christianity kill the ancient poets? So yeah, thank you both for uh, these really thoughtful and um, uh, very challenging uh, responses. Um, I guess let, let, me, um, let, me, let me actually uh, make a case, uh, which has been um, it's been alluded to in both of these responses for why I, or uh, my argument that there's a deeper continuity between classical liberalism and progressive liberalism. I think most of us live in a world, whatever kind of, you know, the, the two sides that we sort of see in our politics today uh, are basically, you're, you line up with either the classical liberal tradition, which is called conservative, uh, or with the progressive liberal tradition, which is called progressivism, or used to be called liberalism uh, by itself. And we occupy this world in which we see these as polar opposites. There's sort of, you know, you're one or the other. You're defined by being in one, one camp or the other camp. And of course, the, I think the part of my book that's been, um, has received probably the most attention, both, um, interestingly, the highest compliments on from both the right and the left are the indictment I make against the other side. So, uh, you know, I had President Obama and I recently had a podcast with Ezra Klein and Ezra Klein loved my book because he said it was a great indictment against income inequality and my book shot up to number one in income inequality uh, uh, category on Amazon, which surprised me that uh, this is what it was about. It's also ironic you celebrated. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> You should have raised the price. <laughs> Amazon did. <laughs> yeah, the Amazon's doing fine. Uh, <laughs> uh, but like, let me let me actually uh, let me at least make something of the case for why why I argue that in fact there is a deeper continuity uh, between these two positions, and it, and it requires that one steps outside of these two positions and sort of sees them from the outside. And for me, that is kind of. Tocqueville's very helpful. I mean, not that he's completely outside, but he's helpful because he's, he comes as someone who's neither of one party or the other. He says, I'm, I, if by not being in either party, it's possible to see farther uh, and to see clearer. Um, but I also, you know, I, 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 as a, both someone interested in the classical tradition and as a Catholic, uh, you, you say, how can you have Aristotle after? Uh, after Christianity, we got we got Aquinas, so we're, we 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 got some ammunition there. Uh, but uh, but it's possible to kind of step outside of both of these and see the deeper continuity. So let, let me let me address one of the ways I see a continuity that I think touches directly on uh, Jonah's challenge, at least as regards kind of material progress. And I think you know you see that that one of the ways you can say classical liberalism understands um, that there's a there's a uh, that, that the source of human freedom and the nature of human freedom uh, 
consists in our liberation simultaneously from each other that we're not bound to anyone unless we make the choice to be bound to other people, which is a choice that can be revised. Uh, and so he allows for at least divorce when uh, the children are grown up uh, so that you can revise just about any choice. What used to be till death do we part yeah, maybe, you know, when you get to your, your older years and you want to travel uh, uh, with, with somebody younger, uh, that's, uh, that's an option. Um, and, of course, the logic of that we can see play itself out in our contemporary life today. But that the other aspect in which we achieve liberation is through the conquest of nature. This is the kind of Baconian uh, argument, that, that through our mastery over nature, our ability to manipulate and to... Um, alter nature to serve our purposes, we also achieve a kind of liberty. And what, what the classical tradition, classical liberal tradition understood was that this was something you do to the world out there. So when I think about nature, it's nature out there. It's the stuff of the world that you manipulate and you conquer. And this is, of course, a deep part of what we think about as conservatism today. It's drill, baby, drill. It's, you know, it's, it's uh, 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 you know, it's basically what Jonah said, you know, whatever whatever progress that can be achieved technologically, materially, and otherwise, you can't stop. There's no way you can stop that, and it would be wrong to even claim that there's, uh, that there's any basis to stopping this. And where, the, where the, the progressive liberal tradition takes this in interesting ways is to say, it turns out that the most manipulable material is human nature. That's the nature that we will, once we, once we master that nature, then we'll really be free. And in fact, what you see is this kind of interesting inversion in which pr progressive liberals say, you should not, this is the critique of romanticism, you should not try to conquer nature out there. We should all be good environmentalists. Right? We should, we should you know, have lots of, lots of communing with nature, and we, should, we shouldn't drill baby drill. But when it comes to our own natures, we should be able to manipulate our own natures without limit. Of course, our reproduction, um, our genomic code, and so forth. And the argument you get there is exactly the one that Jonah made. There's no way of stopping this. This kind of progress has to happen. R remember the arguments that Obama made or that Hillary made in, in, in her campaign, right? That, that uh, you have to follow the science. And that was code for saying there's no ethical or moral consideration when it comes to our ability to master our nature that can be applied. You simply follow the science, which means no external consideration. And in this sense, I think there's a, you can see a deep continuity, even for the differences between classical liberalism and progressive liberalism. And I, I suspect that Jonah would say, well, there's a difference here. And I would, in some senses, agree with him. But I would want to stress the deeper continuities here, that the argument that he made is exactly the argument that Obama and Hillary made when it comes to genetic manipulation and so forth, the kind of inevitability of scientific progress. And this is one area where I think you see this extraordinary kind of, um, uh, of continuity, and I could, I could mention others, but let me, let me stop there. Just very, very briefly, just to, um, um, I, I was with Charles the whole way uh, uh, until he got to Tocqueville's praise of our constitutional formalities and capitalism. And I'm teaching a class on Tocqueville right now, and I wonder if my students uh, uh, are, were also squirming in their seats a little bit. Uh, Tocqueville does have a chapter on the Constitution. He does have some praise for the Constitution, but it's a pretty, it's a long chapter, but the, but the vast majority of his book, Democracy in America, is a stress upon the need to have, in some ways, cultural forms and formalities. That the political forms and formalities are really, um, they're, let's say they're perhaps necessary, but really not sufficient. And to the extent that they're not sufficient, they're ultimately not determinative. They can be helpful, uh, but that when when this you know when we when we encounter Tocqueville, the stress is upon a, a kind of a whole set of non-liberal, and we might even call them today illiberal, forms and ways of life and practices that are, serve as correctives to modern democracy, which I think is distinct from classical democracy, uh, and which serve as these correctives to, and even counterweights, uh, to what he sees as the, as the problems and challenges of democracy. What he stresses is not, um, is not the kinds of f constitutional forms, 
What he really stresses, interestingly, is a kind of polis life, the life in the township, the life in the locality that Jonah was stressing, that, that it's a shared civic life and the belief and encounter that we share a destiny together. Not the assertion of our rights, but the experience of, and indeed a kind of tutoring in our duties and our obligations to each other by which we secure our liberty as, as a common project. And so I was with Charles the whole way, and then he suddenly went off and talking about constitutionalism and capitalism, which I th think he just pulled out the page from the Republican National Committee and, and began reading <laughs> that, which doesn't sound to me very much like Tocqueville at all. So me, I'll leave it there. Right. Uh, gentlemen, uh, uh, maybe a word of response? Uh, you want to go first on this one? Oh, uh, after you. All right. So, uh, <laughs> And I got a bone to pick with you about ideology later. Um, <laughs> it's not my, definition, not, not my definition of ideology. Um, look, I, I find your argument about the inverse nature of the, sort of the progressive liberals' argument about human nature versus the uh, supposedly conservative liberals' argument about external nature to be really interesting and insightful, but I just don't think it proves what you're trying to prove. Um, and uh, because there is just a, to me, there is a profound difference between, uh, you know, big public health projects to cure rickets or blindness or to uh, ensure that uh, people don't get flooded out of their homes and telling people that if they can just play with their genes, they can make themselves look like a lion, right? I mean, there's this, uh, there, there, these are different things that get at, that touch on different notions of the sacred, that touch on different notions of what it means to be a human being. And to say, well, if you just, if you, if you dig deep enough, you can see the, the, all, these two ideas come from the same roots. It's an interesting argument, but at the end of the day, I just think they're, in reality, it's a category error to say that these are mirror images of each other because there's just some practical differences between them. Um, I'd also say that a lot of progressive liberalism goes the other way on this. So much of progressive liberalism, which is much more invested in identity politics than it is in genetic engineering, um, basically says, follows demised, an anti-liberal, anti-enlightenment, you know, ultramontane Catholic thinker who basically says we are all locked in our iron cage of identity and that um, no matter, and this is one of the reasons why I despise identity politics and it breaks my heart that so much of the right is moving towards identity politics. Identity politics says, is, is it fundamentally illiberal because it says simply by virtue of an accident of your birth, some people are more valuable or worthwhile or, or um, important than other people. And one of the great and glorious things that the American founders did was get rid of titles of nobility, which were one of the very first forms of identity politics. <clears throat> and today, the left argues incessantly, you know, believe all women. Um, is an argument that, reduces, that takes away all agency out of individual women and reduces them to a single victim type. Um, and you can do this through all the different you know, colors of the rainbow of, of racial and gender diversity um, that play across through identity politics. And that's not an argument um, that is about you know, the ability to conquer nature, except when you get into some of these strange arguments about how people, how there are 56 different genders and all that kind of stuff. Um, and the one thing I would say I'm surprised where I thought Charles was going to go with at least part of this. I mean, I knew there was going to be a de Tocqueville fight, you know. It's like, might as well just have brought a wad of cash and made bets like you know, the, you know, the, the Russian roulette scene and, you know, um, whatever that was, uh, um, Deer Hunter. Um, bitty meow, bitty meow. Anyway, so, um, uh, so one of the things, again, what I, one of the things I really love about Patrick's book is this case for devolution of not revolution, and I think you're absolutely right, and it's a responsible thing to say that revolution would lead to more problems, not less, but sending power down to local communities to empower people. You know, I'm a big believer in, you know, this idea that you get out of Hayek's fatal conceit about the microcosm and the macrocosm, the rules of the microcosm, the rules of family and association and community are fundamentally different than the rules of the extended order of liberty. The extended order of liberty is how you deal with strangers, the family is how you deal with someone you have a pre-commitment to that you love, and I, and I agree with you entirely for emphasizing that. Um, but it seems to me the irony of, of what you actually want in terms of a public policy approach 
can be found in this great document called the US Constitution, particularly things like the Ninth and Tenth Amendment. And um, the, a big chunk of what liberalism is, the new science of politics that you talk about, is about how to actually structure a society to allow for the things that you're talking about. And I agree with you, part of the problem with the rights culture that we have is that we start defining ourselves, we start exerting these rights as pure, abstracting out these rights in ways about our interpersonal relations, when in really, reality, what they're supposed to be about is checks on the role of the government in Washington, which is why the Bill of Rights is framed in the negative. The government shall pass no law abridging the freedom of this, that, and the other thing. It leaves it up to the states and local communities to figure out how to actually live. And so if you're actually trying to come up with a governing political science about how to actually achieve some of the things you're talking about, it seems to me that the answer lies not in some alternative to liberalism that we missed the exit for 500 years ago, but in actually revisiting the kind of liberalism that places like the Claremont Review of Books and others write about, which is founded in the Constitution, which says that the administrative state and the government of Washington has acquired way too much power, not because of liberalism, but in despite of it, um, seems to me the better course of action. Okay, <laughs> at, at a risk of putting some more money on the pile, <laughs> uh, the <laughs> Tocqueville throwdown. Um, yeah, no, I think, um, uh, I, I certainly don't, uh, I, I didn't mean to say that Tocqueville um, at all neglects, in fact, he, as you say correctly, he, he emphasizes um, the art and science of associations, which takes place at the local level, primarily. Um, but he regards that as part of the architecture of which the Constitution is the crowning part, um, the purpose of which as a whole is to leaven the majority's um, force in democracy and to, and to lift democracy into something liberal and liberating for human, um, for human beings and for human um, freedom. I, I don't think we disagree um, about that. My only, the larger question I was raising really is that Tocqueville, though he is quite aware of the phenomenon of liberalism and liberal philosophy, regards our problem as different from that. Our problem is democracy. Uh, and our problem is the equality of conditions and the form of government that that equality of conditions uh, may give rise to, if not checked by these salutary mores, customs, and so forth um, that we were just talking about. But if that's the case, then the, the, liberal, the, uh, the off-ramp we're looking for before liberalism began is for Tocqueville not relevant to the question of what we do here and now in a democratic world to make the best of democracy. That was really the, the point I was driving at, that this is not a question of exchanging philosophies, exchanging our philosophy for a better philosophy, ex going, go, you know, improving on self-evident truths by going to, a, to better truths. Um, as uh, you have described, not in this book, I think, but in the previous book, um, for Tocqueville, that is, that is uh, itself illusory, I think. I mean, his, for, from his point of view, we have to deal with the world as we have it, which is not the creation of philosophy simply, but of many influences, including the Protestant Reformation and actions of the Catholic Church and the discovery of the new world and having a vast continent for settlement with very few European settlers to fill it up, which creates an enormously democratic pressure uh, on that society, uh, valuing individuals very highly because there are few of them and lots of land to be possessed. All of these things, um, which we have to grapple with in a, in a, in a prudential spirit, as it were, and, and not in a theoretical one, whereas what your book well argues for is a theoretical revolution that is necessary for any practical improvement. Let me pose one more question and maybe we'll address it more quickly and then we can turn to the audience. I think 
One of the uh, points of the book that, uh, in my experience, resonates with our students is Patrick's account of loose connections. Liberalism creates loose connections. Uh, the students I have discussed the book with, um, uh, Patrick gives a, an account that makes sense to them of the lives they live. Uh, any thoughts about that point? Does, does Patrick get it right, or do you have uh, observations on that? I largely agree with Patrick about um, a lot of the contemporary problems that we have. I would attribute them more, I mean, th this gets to, you know, it's turtles all the way down kind of argument, but it has more to do with the role of technology today, particularly the technology of the last, you know, 15 years. It's some very depressing charts about teenage suicide rates going down, 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 down like this. And then 2007, the iPhone's invented and they start going like this. And um, I think Facebook is basically an envy machine that helps people curate their lives in a way to make it seem like they're having more fun than they really are. Um, and so I agree with them all of that on, on a lot of that. But I also, um, uh, I just don't know that it's <clears throat> teleologically predetermined that the problems that we have today um, stem from liberalism rather than stem from the fact that technology changes dynamics all the time. For most of the last 100 years, or last 50 years, we thought technology was on the side of individual liberty. Before that, we thought technology was on the side of tyranny in terms of the 1984 prism. Now it's heading back towards the side of tyranny if you just look at what's going on in China. And I, I just don't think that it, there's anything that pre predetermined in all of this. Um, but I think that part of the description of the contemporary world, I think, was very persuasive. Yeah, no, I, I think that's true as well, and um, uh, I would uh, commend Patrick for that description. I mean, it, it's, a, it, it's a diagnosis which is, of course, not unique <laughs> to, uh, to anyone at this table. I mean, the collapse of social capital, the, uh, there are many languages in social science to address uh, what has happened, but what has happened is a kind of um, a a anime uh, and um, it, is, it, it uh, is not being filled by uh, high school education or college education, which, which neither of which come cl comes close to touching the actual hole in the soul that Tocqueville was talking about a long time ago and, and Patrick is pointing to now. May I actually? Yeah, so one of my biggest disappointments about my book, or the reception of my book, is nobody, or hardly anyone, talks about my chapter on technology, uh, which was actually one of my favorite chapters, uh, closely followed by my chapter on liberal education, which also nobody talks about. Uh, but, uh, but the chapter on technology uh, is, is an argument that, um, I, there's no way of proving this, but uh, an argument that, um, what we think of as technology is itself shaped by the deeper technology of our political order. So we don't tend to think of our political order as a technology. In fact, our, our founding fathers knew that it was a kind of technology, right? I mean, Benjamin Rush called it the Constitution a machine that would go of itself. They thought about it in almost mechanical terms. That technology literally means the sort of things that human beings make not the things that are just found sort of spontaneously in nature. So um, you could say anything a human being makes is a, is a form of technology. And so when we think and we speak about technology, we talk about, of course, we're talking about you know, cell phones and internet and so forth, and we tend then to gloss over the fact that the way in which, or even the, even the forms of technology that we adopt and those we discard will be shaped and influenced by the deeper technology that shapes who we are, that helps to create who we are. And thus, if you're an Amish person growing up in an Amish community, the technology you adopt and the technology that you don't adopt is determined by a very different set of questions than those that we implicitly, you know, we are, we're implicitly asking and answering. The, for, an Amish, for a member of an Amish community, the question is, will this technology hurt or, harm, or, or benefit our community? Will it strengthen the bonds that we share with each other, or will it harm the bonds that we have with each other? And in the book, I talk about an example. I got this from a book called The Dismal Science. The example of the issue of insurance in some Amish communities. Something we t take for granted as the basic fact of life. 
And what insurance is, is the ability for us to manage risk without ever having actual obligations to anyone face to face. Whereas in an Amish community, you face risk, damage, loss, death, in cooperation with and with the assistance of the people in your community. So if your house burns down, the people in the community are responsible for, for building, rebuilding that house and so forth. So when we think about technology, when we talk about technology in this, in this term, I think we're treating it too superficially. We're treating it as, in, 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 as a kind of, as the phenomenon, when in fact it's a phenomena that is in fact shaped and influenced by this deeper form of life. And in this sense, you could say that the way that we used technology, and maybe in contrast to China, is going to be in order to liberate ourselves from each other, in order to make these connections looser. And you could say you could look back at the automobile, and you could look back, of course, at you know, various forms of social media and so forth. So I think we have to, I would urge us to be careful about treating technology as if it's this sort of phenomena out there that somehow isn't more deeply connected to the kinds of human beings we are and shaped by our order and therefore deploy and use technology in certain ways and towards certain ends. Uh, in our time remaining, I want to get as many questions from the audience uh, as we can. We have a tradition here at the program. We always invite our undergraduate students to uh, ask the first uh, question. So any undergraduates, uh, Notre Dame or otherwise, uh, have a question they'd like to pose? And I'll ask you to stand up and uh, tell us who you are and speak loudly so we can all hear you. The undergraduates, you can also vent up Professor Dean if you like. Good. The question is on uh, uh, an observation that uh, does, does liberalism usher in a different conception of human nature than the classics of race? And is the Constitution part of that liberal project? I, well, that's the central one of the central contentions of my book. Um, I'll, I'll just give you one example, and we could we could probably spend all night, and Charles and I would go at it. Now we haven't even opened up a debate over the federalist papers yet. That would be <laughs> that would be like a whole day, you know, a whole week's conference. Uh, but let me, I'll give you an example. Um, you know, well, I'm actually teaching a class, and I think you're in my class, uh, on uh, the kind of the, the constitutional tradition in the West. And we've spent uh, most of the semester reading sort of pre-modern and then some more early modern works. And what we've been tracking is the kind of change of view of what the purpose and end of government is for. Right? The purpose and end of government. And one of the things is every class I teach is basically it's the same theme. You know, my students have taken multiple classes with me to realize this. It's basically how our political order is shaped by our assumptions of human nature. That's all we, that's all we study. How our political order is shaped by our assumptions of human nature. And in, in many of the works that we read, we read some Aristotle, um, we read some Aquinas. The argument is that the political order exists in order to secure and advance the common good and that the common good is understood to be in some ways directed toward and by a life lived in accordance with virtue. And that law and the social order exists to cultivate, foster, support virtue, the practice and realization of virtue. And so this doesn't mean that the state necessarily reaches in and says, you know, you must do this or, you must, or you're not allowed to do that, but it will do some of that. It might, for example, say, and this is going to be, I'm, going to, you know, I'm a Catholic university, it might say, on Sundays you will rest. And it may actually write laws, as they've just done in Poland, saying, on Sundays we will not have any commerce, because there's a day of the week when you ought to spend time with your family and ought not to engage in commerce or go to the shopping mall. And that's one way you could say a state would seek to foster and promote a kind of virtue. The Federalist Papers, uh, or a constitutional order, Madison in Federalist 10 makes the following argument that the first object of government is the protection of the diversity and the faculties of men, and that the diversity and the faculties of men elicits in and results in differences in property, and that the first object of government is the protection of these diverse faculties and the consequences of those diverse faculties. In other words, that it's the protection of property. 
the first object of government is the protection of the differentiation that we achieve because of our different faculties that secures for us private ends and private goods, our differences in property, our capacity to gain or attain differences, distinct achievements in our economic and productive lives. Now that's a, I, I, I'm not discounting or arguing that that's not a good and important end of politics, but for me, according to the classical tradition, it's not the first object of government. And in fact, it is a secondary object, one that's subject to the object of the common good. And that the question of property and the accumulation of property is itself subject to questions and determinations and considerations of the common good. So I would say in this respect that we live in a, in a particular order that evaluates and concludes that a certain end and object of human, uh, of, of government is connected to a certain conception of human nature. And that conception of human nature, one finds articulated in John Locke, for whom the differences in the attainments of property is the key and maybe the key of understanding uh, the, the kind of, the, the, the form and object and aims of human life. Charles, do you want to? <laughs> well, if you, if you insist. Um, uh, look, I, I don't think, um, very few people have ever said that property is not subject to regulation and for the sake of the common good. Certainly Locke never says that. Uh, once you're in civil society, the measure of property is the civil law. That's part of the definition of not being in the state of nature anymore, which means that the civil law passed by the legislature to secure the common good is, is the measure of property. I mean, that it's subject to a political overrule uh, for the sake of the common good. And as far as the Federalist goes, um, and here we could have a long and interesting conversation, I don't think it's, you know, if, in Federalist 3, Publius says that safety is the first object of government. Safety meaning national security. Uh, in Federalist 10, he says the protection of the of the uh, uh, diversity in the faculties of men from which the rights of property originate is the first object of government. In 57, he says, safety is among the primitive objects of government, and that the end of government is the public good or the public happiness. So it seems to me that one could argue, and I'm, I, uh, this is not the time to go into it, but one could argue that there is, in fact, a fairly capacious view, even in the Federalist, of the importance of property, but the limitations of property as, a, as an ingredient of the public happiness and the, and the public uh, good. And that, I don't think that's the difference um, that, that you're searching for between Locke and, uh, and the tradition, per se. I mean, I think there are some differences, I'm not, but I, I don't think that is one of them. Another question. Yeah. Um, sure, Rowan. Uh, my name is Rowan. I'm the fourth generation student here. Mr. Kessler, I really enjoyed your comments. Uh, There's some that I thought about from my participation in Dutch Benin when you got on the committee, so I'll be careful for that three minutes. <laughs> 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 but, but I agree. I think Tony sort of Phil would say that it's a broader comment on democracy. It's not actually liberalism, but it's democracy. And uh, some of the things I've got to talk about in the field are very similar to the Tokyo process. Um, and then also the way he, he phrases the Federalist in the Federalism and he says it in a way that uh, it's a product of this new novel form of Federalism that created this new the phrase. He calls it wise and patriotic. Um, but yeah, he says uh, the Constitution is not a model of perfection. Um, and he calls for a new political science, a new kind of liberalism, uh, even though he phrases uh, the idea of self-interest well understood. Uh, in his book notes, he says that the doctrine of self-interest is certainly understood to teach a man how to live, uh, but not how to die. And then it's only in teaching a man how to die that he truly be truly interested in it. And that's the doctrine of Jesus Christ, something that the pre-liberal inheritance has protected in his art. Uh, so, in a way, I guess my question for you, Mr. Kessler, is is there a sort of critique of the public service, whether an implicit critique of the founding, you know, the that we need something new for the science to
uh, and the book is part of the meaning is uh, doing, uh, some people are criticizing for saying, oh, they're wanting to go back to a pre liberal age. But in a way, it says what we need is uh, not to get rid of the liberalism, but a new kind of liberalism. Yeah. So are you, we argue for a new kind of liberalism, one that respects separation of powers, freedom of press, freedom of religion, but thought of it in a new way, and so it's really Good. The question centers on Tocqueville and Tocqueville's call for a, a new type of liberalism, so perhaps a liberalism that doesn't go back to more classical traditions and might even in some ways break from our constitutional tradition. Uh, and, and just for the record, I happen to be taking notes on Raul's dissertation proposal. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just sent a note that I signed off on it. <laughs> um, well, that, it sounds like a terrific dissertation proposal. Uh, I, I, good luck, and uh, I, I look forward to the results. Um, that's a difficult question. The relation between the Federalists and, and Tocqueville is a difficult question because the Federalists is, after all, not a, it wasn't written as a treatise on politics. Um, it says uh, late in the, in the book that it's... It's not like, it's not, uh, it, it isn't a, meant to be a series of essays um, on, on a central theme. It is a, a, a doc, it's, a, it's a document whose first purpose is to persuade the voters of New York that it's in their interest to vote for the Constitution of the United States or to have their representatives in the convention vote for it. Um, so it has less uh, theoretical pretensions in a way, you might say, than Tocqueville does. And it is true, Tocqueville calls for a new science for a world you know, made completely new, the democratic world. Um, and what he supplies it does go beyond the Federalist. I mean, the Federalist is, after all, not about anything in a way except the Constitution and the Union and how you need to ratify the Constitution to secure the Union and why the Constitution is a good Republican document, even better, it turns out, than the state constitutions. Um, it doesn't have to say, and it would be wildly out of base to say anything about the you know, critical or, eva or e evaluative of the New York civil society of Rhode Island, of you know, what's going on in the states, of how the schools of the states, in those that have common schools, are being regulated. That's not its brief. If it, if it began to talk about those things, it would prove the argument of the anti-federalists that this is not a constitution of limited and enumerated powers, but one that is going to empower the federal government to inquire into every aspect of American life. That's, ad that's <clears throat> advanced liberalism, not the liberalism that the framers were defending. So yes, Tocqueville provides, you know, Tocqueville looks at many, everything that the Federalist doesn't look at. Religion, per se, although the Federalist talks about religion a little bit. Education, mores, relations between women and men, education of children. He gives you a wonderful panoramic view of America in its, not just its governmental aspects, but in its civil society, in the way its families and its associations conduct themselves. To that extent, it is far beyond what the Federalist uh, is concerned with and is arguing for. Um, and of course, it also presumes something that the Federalist is not free to presume, which is that uh, it, a, a democracy will be worldwide, uh, will be triumphant worldwide. And therefore the question is, you know, given that there are no regime alternatives to democracy, there is still the difference which is crucial between liberal democracy and, and uh, uh, illiberal democracy or democracy with servitude. Uh, the, the Federalist is, is arguing for Republican government in a world that is overwhelmingly monarchical and ruled by empires, um, which are ruled by mo themselves by monarchies. And so it's a, it, is, it, it has a different agenda. And yes, I mean, for that reason, Tocqueville is free to talk about everything in a way that the Federalist was not free to talk about. So I, 
I, I suspect the reason that you're all still sitting here at 9.05 at night on a Thursday, which most of you students have elsewhere to be, I imagine, uh, is A, you're probably very polite and you don't want to get up, but, but B, I think you all, most of you here, think something very deep is at stake in this debate. And I think it's the following. Something has gone terribly wrong in our country, and what do we do now? And implicit in the kind of debate we've been having is, what do we go back to? Right. Do we go back to the Constitution in 1789, 1787, or do we go back to the polis or Aquinas? And I want to state very clearly, we don't go back to anything. There's no going back. There's no recreating something that once was. What we can do, it seems to me, is look to the past and look to the teachings of the past to learn where certain missteps were taken, to try to understand how we got to this point, and my book is an effort uh, to, to make that analysis, uh, and then to know where we go from here. And I, I suspect that there's a lot of agreement around this table that where we go from here involves, at some level, um, a redefinition of freedom. And I think all of us at this table are pro-freedom. Somebody said, well, what about liberty? Mm -hmm. I'm pro-liberty but properly understood, right? Liberty as a form, as an achievement, as an achievement in particular of a kind of discipline and a capacity to govern ourselves as individuals and collectively. And this is, of course, this is the classical definition of liberty, and it wasn't contrary to what the framers hoped, but they hoped that society would provide the kinds of local, familial, social, forms of life that would reinforce and secure those. We now live in a society in which I think it's fair to say those have been largely eviscerated, extensively eviscerated. And what we see is a society that praises liberty now largely understood as the absence of any constraint on our freedom, whether in terms of our economic life, in terms of our social life, in terms of our political life. I came to Notre Dame because I thought this was an institution where if there is going to be a rebirth of liberty, in this country by this understanding. It's going to have to be led by an institution like this that still has a deep connection historically, philosophically, theologically to this understanding of liberty. And I think what's incredibly rewarding to me is to be in this discussion with so many people here stuck to their seats at nine o'clock on a Thursday <laughs> night in which all of us see that this is what's at stake. And I think in this sense, we don't have a lot of disagreement over this. That's good. I know there are a lot of hands, so... Uh, Hi, I'm Yannick Capella, I'm a two out here at the law school. Um, thank you all for speaking tonight. I want to try to get everyone here, because I think Jonah wants to leave for The talk feels great. <laughs> but what do you think about the Federalist Papers? <laughs> so I think uh, a big issue that's working within the discussion seems to be the problem of like the fitness or the neutrality of liberalism. Um, and, and I think as Professor Denise said, how it smuggles in an account of the good life that uh, uh, under the guise of neutrality. Um, so as scandalous as the term illiberalism is nowadays, um, might that be what we actually want? Um, a certainty shared by the citizenry of the correctness of certain principles and a vision of the good life. Um, and what we're recoiling from is not really the illiberalism of social justice warriors, but their social justice-ness. And so, um, in other words, the issue is not really with illiberalism, but that it's the wrong kind of I want you to take that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, yeah, uh, so uh, I'm against all forms of philosophical, uh, ethical, political monism. I don't think you should reduce anything down to a single factor. The whole point in life is to be. Um, is to find the right balance of things. And, um, uh, you know, the example I often use is if, if I dedicated myself a thousand percent solely to my wife, first of all, I'd be super creepy. <laughs> um, I would make her unhappy, and I would be a bad father, I would be uh, a bad provider, I would be a bad worker, I'd be a bad citizen. 
And you can do this with everything. It's, and so the point is, in, 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 and this is a scalable proposition at every level of government. And so the problem I have with the social justice warrior types, if I understand the, the question correctly, it's not so much that they're illiberal, because there's lots of illiberalisms that I am, you know, or let me put it this way. There are lots of, there are plenty of undemocratic things that I am very much in favor of, starting with the Bill of Rights. And um, so the, the trick is, uh, and there's, there are illiberalisms that I am uh, very much in favor of, starting with the family, right? I always try to tell people that in the family, we are communists. If you have two sons, and one's a lunkhead, and the other one's a great student, you don't feed the great student better than you feed the lunkhead, right? Um, it, it truly is from each according to his ability to each according to their need. You don't put price tags on things. This is one of the points that Hayek makes, Hayek makes is that if you take, and that Schumpeter makes, is that, and then Patrick makes, is that if you take the principles of the extended order of the market and you apply them to the, the microcosm of the family, you destroy the family. But I also believe that if you take the, the model of the family and employ it to the macrocosm of the extended order, you destroy liberty and you um, destroy the individual pursuit of happiness. Because one person's definition, even though I believe in all sorts of definitions of virtue, one person's definition of virtue um, may be another person's definition of something that's the reverse of virtue. This doesn't mean that you should have no definitions of virtue, but you should tread lightly on uh, how, how, how tight you want to impose your definition on virtue on others. And those decisions should be made the closest to where people actually live. And, and so I've been on, because I'm so cool, I've been on panels debating conservatism versus libertarianism now for 25 years. And uh, it almost invariably, some kid with a propeller beanie will ask, you know, this is all very interesting, but if we just went back to the vision of the founders where we pushed these things down to the federal structure where these decisions were made at the local level, wouldn't that solve almost all of these arguments that you're having? And whether it's Charles Murray or Nick Gillespie or me or whoever it is on the panel, you know, whether we're conservative or libertarian, we all say, pretty much yeah. And um, the problem with the social justice warriors types is it's, it's not that they want safe spaces, it's they want nothing but safe spaces. It's, the, it's a totalizing vision. The most fascistic thing that's said on a college campus, and it's said every single day, is if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. There's no safe harbor from politics. And that's a kind of monism, to think that politics is everything. One of the reasons why I'm a conservative is because I think politics should only be a partial, part of, a partial philosophy of life, and there are other things that are more important. Um, so I don't know if that quite answers the question, but it's sort of how I approach I approach it at least. Okay, let's get some more questions. Uh, please, sir, yeah. Yeah, so, Mr. Denis, um, I, when I was reading your book, I, uh, which is very timely at this uh, moment, uh, especially with European or Western politics in general, there there's comes a, uh, a moment when you realize that the populists and nationalists in Europe are pretty much using the prosecutor's uh, handbook that you present in, in your book. And, uh, given how the ending didn't really comment on what happens next, and that seems to be what is happening right now. I would just, I'm very curious about what you have to, to say on that. If I can repeat the question, yeah. a broad one, but uh, reflections about uh, uh, currents of populism and nationalism in Europe, uh, and uh, how your book might right. shed some light on that. Yeah, actually, I finished the book um, really kind of before, uh, it, was, it was after Brexit, but before a lot of these populist uh, uh, elections in Europe, certainly Hungary and Poland weren't quite on the horizon. And, and frankly, um, my area of interest and expertise is the United States, so part of the reason uh, that I didn't comment on it is due to when it was completed, and secondly, simply a, a degree of unfamiliarity with, with, those, with those countries. Uh, I would say that, uh, I would add that my book is being translated into Hungarian and Polish, <laughs> and, I, and I'm waiting, uh, I'm told I'll be invited to give lectures over there about the book. So I expect to learn a lot about how it's received and the kinds of uh, discussions that it, that it spurs uh, in some of these countries. <clears throat> my, my, only, uh, my, my only other comment would be, uh, uh, at the time I was writing it, around the time I, I wrote it, uh, I read and we actually invited to campus uh, a Polish philosopher named Richard Legutko who's written a phenomenal book called The Demon in Democracy. 
And the book, and Jonah may be familiar with the book, and but he's certainly familiar with its argument. The book is an argument essentially that life under, totalitarian, under Soviet totalitarianism, which he experienced in Poland, and life under the liberal EU is effectively the same. In terms of the kind of commitments and, uh, um, and the enforcement of a way of life that's particularly hostile to local forms of life, family, um, uh, uh, culture, uh, and so forth. And so I think that the, the responses and reactions in, 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 the, in these parts of Europe are very much in response to a kind of totalizing liberalism that we've just heard about. You know, again, whether it's, it's a kind of trajectory or whether it's its, its own thing, that's, that's a debate we, we, we can have elsewhere. But it's a powerful argument, and I think if liberals slash elites don't want the potential for a fascistic reaction, a nationalist, a new birth of fascism in some parts of Europe, they had better stop being fascistic in their liberalism. Let's get one away. There you go. Now we're in my wheelhouse. Hi, I'm Audra. I'm a PhD student in sociology at the University of Maine. Dr. Neen, having offered example of Poland and his laws about commerce on Sundays, I'm wondering if you could elaborate on your view of the role of Christianity in politics, especially in shaping this liberal political system. As you might be aware, there are a number of young Catholics are particularly interested in the idea of integralism, which recognizes that the temporal common good is subject to the eternal common good. Temporal political authority should therefore be subordinated to the guidance and rule of the Catholic Church. Now, integralism is not theocracy, but it recognizes the Church as having the fullness of the truth, unlike the liberal American separation of church and state. Could integralism be a topical? The question is on integralism and its uh, proper place in uh, <laughs> Yeah, so I'm very grateful to uh, that Adrian Vermeule is to my right. So I, so I don't, so I, I don't look like I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm as crazy on the right as, as some people might think. I, I'm, I'm fascinated by, I'm fascinated by these arguments. Um, I think they're extremely interesting. I think uh, the, the, the book. Um, uh, the author's name is escaping me. Before Church and State, that describes uh, that describes uh, much of and has inspired much of this thinking. It's a fascinating book. I I think it's necessary, and this is this is you know uh, to repeat something I just said. I think this is one version of what we can go back to that I think is not really um, on the on the agenda at the moment. I think it's implausible to think that we're going to have an integralist revolution in the United States, which is founded as a Protestant country and still is a Protestant country. Even when nobody's a Christian anymore, or exceedingly few people are Christians, they're still Protestants. Uh, it's simply where the main line has gone. Uh, they've, they've left the main line and they're now living in the suburbs. Let and me in tell the you a story about the Jews. Yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> there we go. So. Um, uh, I think it's I think it's fascinating, but here's here's where, I'll, where I will I will give uh, a shout out uh, and props to the integralist understanding. I think it understands better than liberal understanding of the separation of church and state what the true source of the limitations of the state is. That that before Catholic Christianity and before Christianity as a whole, before Christ, before the incarnation, there was no such thing as a limited government. The government could determine everything, including theology, including you know, you know, uh, uh, you know whether or not you were a member of a family or whether you were simply you know a soldier in the family, for example, in Sparta. Uh, there was no such thing as a limited government. Christianity introduces the first conception of a limited government, not because it seeks to limit government, but because it understands that nothing is more capacious, nothing is more true, whole, and eternal than the kingdom of God. And that's the true source of limited government. And to the extent that we've lost sight of that, to the extent that we've low relocated the idea of limited government in a liberal set of understandings, I think there's no, it's, it's not a coincidence that we cease to have anything resembling limited government. So I think a very valuable contribution of this very interesting development within Catholic thought, and it's one I think deserves to be developed and heard and, uh, uh, and considered is, I think, a fuller and more capacious and deeper understanding 
of how and in what ways the state is ultimately limited. We tried to get Professor Ramil to join us today. He was unavailable. Adrian, if you're watching, you should have been here. Okay, let's get one more. Yeah, an undergrad, perhaps? Do we have an undergrad? Yeah, please. Yeah, so, um, I'm Nicholas Holmes. I'm a sophomore student of political science and history at Notre Dame. One of, I found one of the most intriguing and probably relevant parts of your book, Professor Green, was your discussion. I had the discussion yesterday was the discussion of education and how liberalism has kind of ironically devalued the liberal education. So, I guess. How do you um, handle this diagnosis? Do you agree with it? And so, how would you address this fault that that's really nice? Okay, this is a nice way to end. Maybe all three of you actually could speak on the, the role of uh, liberal education uh, and what, maybe what liberalism does to it, or it, the role of liberal education in uh, uh, making liberalism better. Patrick, do you want to maybe start and maybe you can say just a word or two about the argument of your. No, I'll go last. <laughs> <laughs> Liberal education. You're the professor. <laughs> <laughs> um, that I am. But, um, well, uh, obviously uh, it depends on which liberalism you're talking about. Um, the, the current um, postmodern, essentially uh, nihilistic liberalism, which, which worships um, ultimately power, more not truth, um, is... Uh, fatal to liberal education properly understood. Uh, the, the university today is, uh, the modern university is in a sense the established church of the modern liberal state. Uh, it is where the functionaries and the soldiers for, for liberalism are trained uh, and indoctrinated and prepared in the latest doctrines of combat which are then imported increasingly directly into the mainstream of American politics. Uh, it's essentially uh, a, a venue for political re-education. It's turned the university into a kind of re-education camp rather than um, a, a, a place of inquiry. Uh, I think the, a, a subsidiary question which is very interesting is what place does religious education or do religious colleges and universities have left in the modern liberal dispensation for higher education. They were the basis of the earliest liberal education in the country. Almost every college, every college founded in the beginning was affiliated with some church and this was in keeping with, you might say, the sense of religious responsibility that attended freedom and, and rights I think in the mind of the founding generation, there, there were no rights really without some correlative duties. Um, but the question, uh, the question today I think is can you be a good, uh, can, you, can you be a good Christian or can you believe in God and be a good citizen of the United States at the same time? Um, and the direction of policy by the by the liberal left, by the extreme left today, is to answer no, you can't, and you have to choose uh, between those two things. Uh, I think this, the original American solution was that yes, it was very possible to be both, and you were encouraged to be both. When Tocqueville looked at America, he saw the spirit of liberty and the spirit of religion going hand in hand. They were mutually reinforcing. Unlike France, where they were pitted against each other as mortal enemies. Well, we're France. Now, we're revolutionary France in the, in the sense that increasingly, fortunately not entirely, but increasingly the spirit of religion and the spirit of freedom or of modern freedom in the sense in which Patrick was talking about it as the absence of external impediments to the will, um, nihilistic freedom, uh, those are at a, uh, on a collision course and it is a huge question for the future of America whether we can bring religion and freedom back to the same, uh, uh, back to as allies in the same pursuit of citizenship. Um, one of the reasons I didn't bring up that part of Patrick's book is I agree with it entirely and I quoted from some of the writings that led to it, I assume, uh, in my book. Um, I think 
uh, he's absolutely right about what's going on on college campuses. You know, obviously there are exceptions. I mean, I was at a Christian college two days ago that um, is certainly an outlier. Um, um, and there are exceptions on campuses as well. But as a general proposition on elite campuses uh, around the country, uh, there, how to put this? So I have this theory that you judge utopia, that, that utopian movements are basically just defined by what the model of utopia they want to come up with. And I think for an entire class of sort of elite, uh, sort of Schumpeterian new class intellectuals, they, what they want to do is they never want to leave college. And when you go to places like Harvard and Yale and all that kind of stuff, and you talk to these kids, who come from great schools they're, and all the rest, and they come from good families, they work hard, and they belong there, and all the rest. I always like to ask them, so let me get this straight. So, you know, your food is paid for, your clothing is paid for, <laughs> your utilities are paid for, your security is provided for you, the food is provided for you, um, uh, security, you know, all, all the way down the list. The only thing that's really expected of you is to read a bunch of interesting things, prove that you read it, and have a really good time and meet interesting people. And you think you're independent? Right? I mean, this is essentially an aristocratic way of living with very few ex expectations upon you. Similarly, these kids get taught, you know, uh, one of the things I think where, where Patrick and I would probably agree a great deal is that rebellion today is the new conformity. Mm -hmm. We teach people, watch car commercials where you have these guys who, like this one where this guy goes into a witness protection program and they're providing him a new home and a new identity, but when he gets a low-end SUV, he says, I, I just can't, I can't sell out that way. You know, when he has to be a maverick who plays by his own rules with a better SUV, right? Corporate America sells this sense of rebellion, which is this kind of conformity on college campuses. I've probably been to 100 college campuses in the last 20 years. And one of the things you find almost ubiquitously is this notion that being liberal is in the sort of, being progressive in the, uh, is, is rebellious. And I always like to ask them, you know, so let me get this straight. So your, your professors are liberal, the administration is liberal, the mainstream media is liberal, uh, academia in general is liberal, Hollywood is liberal, the music industry is liberal, the fashion industry is liberal, the publishing industry is liberal, most sports columnists are liberal, most Fortune 500 comp companies are liberal, and you think you're sticking it to the man <laughs> by agreeing with them, right? And they would look at me with the same way that my old basset hound would look at me when I tried to feed it a grape. Just sort of, <laughs> you know, unblinking in comprehension. And and so I, I, I agree entirely with that part of, of Patrick's book about the, you know, that, 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 that teaching the liberal arts used to be a part about, in large part, about teaching virtue. Because the, virtue was a sort of, is a kind of courage. And it's about uh, the things that you need to know and understand to be a defender and, and a custodian of liberty in a free society. We don't teach that anymore. We teach it that it's a lifestyle. And that's a real, real problem. So um, it is, uh, this is the puzzle, right? How is it that in a liberal society and a uh, ever more free liberal society that there's an abandonment uh, of the liberal arts? It's the very, the very word, liberal, right? Is the essence of the liberal arts. What is it that's being taught in and through the liberal arts? And why is it being abandoned and discarded in a liberal society? And I, and I think, and this is what I argue in the book, the key to understanding this is the transformation of the meaning of what liberty is, of the essence of what liberty is. And if liberty is the capacity and ability to do what I want with as few obstacles as possible, then what you will see is a transformation in two forms. First, a, a massive uh, influx into those disciplines that allow us to control nature, the STEM disciplines, what we're seeing, uh, of course, on our campuses. And secondly, a transformation in our humanities, in which human beings are now understood to be pliable, plastic creatures that are subject to our will and creation. And indeed, that the humanities are approached in a way in which we, the moderns, the progressed, understand everything better than those who preceded us. We have nothing to learn from the past.
what we see on, on our college campuses is the ver very opposite of the liberal arts because of a transformed definition of liberty. And why it's so vital and essential to restore the liberal arts isn't because we want to have critical thinking. A BS and screw critical thinking. <laughs> uh, it's not because we want to have, be able to have conversations over cocktails when we graduate uh, and, and, and you know, go to parties in Georgetown. It's because we want to be a free people. We want to be a free people as individuals in the way we live our lives, and we want to be free citizens. And a society that abandons the liberal arts is a society that is no longer free. So those students who are still here, and many of you are, kudos, because I think tonight is an example, of, it's really exemplary that you desire and you crave, and perhaps you even got a little bit of a liberal education tonight. I certainly feel that I did, and I thank you all for that. Thank you. Notre Dame is a very special place for a number of reasons, uh, in part because we have faculty members like uh, Professor Denise who write such interesting books, give us so much to talk about, uh, but also because of our alumni and friends, and especially our students. So I want to echo uh, uh, Professor Denise. Uh, thank you for coming out tonight, for staying uh, so long, for your good questions. I invite you to come back uh, tomorrow morning, uh, despite what is uh, the negative connotation of cocktails after a few cocktails tonight. Come back tomorrow morning. Uh, and join us at 11 a.m. in the Nanadic Hall Forum, where uh, we'll let uh, Professor Kessler and Mr. Goldberg go at each other. Uh, I'm going to get Ursine on his ass. <laughs> <laughs> Please join me in making our